Okay, welcome to the Nation Podcast. My name is Eric Thorell, I'm your host with co-host Tom Jones. And today we have actually a double feature here. We have two special guests on, and we'd like to thank for them coming down here. Uh, first, we have a former Sabercat great, uh, James Hunden. Well, hello everybody. It's great to be here, and uh, I'm excited to be on the show. And then we also have from the, the San Francisco Examiner, examiner.com, for all your techie guys, Mr. David here. Ms. What's going on, David? Uh, not a whole lot. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to have you guys both on. I know we, uh, Tom and I have actually, first of all, been trying to get James on for a while, you know, with his busy schedule. Busy, 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 busy schedule. Busy. You know, he's Mr. Popular, even though he retired years ago. <laughs> 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 so, and now we have David as a special guest. Um, one of our featured guests that we've had for the, from the fan perspective, John Caramini, is he actually got in contact with David, you know, because both John and I both saw an article first about the Sabercats and the reason why they left the league, you know, in that situation, what happened. So we got David on for that, and then he wrote a follow-up article now about, well, not really a follow-up, but an additional article about the same fanfare as um, Portland, you know, basically all taking over about what's going on with the league and the arena football. And we're having James on because, you know, he has personal inside information as far as for being involved and being a player and winning two of the ABs against the Snake team. You know, and, whether and, it was in our house or yeah. in their house, we still beat them. And you know what? I got something to say about that. And I hope you don't mind. I'm going to pay a little homage to you. Uh oh. That's okay. okay. Go right ahead. So, here we are, past Arena Bowl, Arizona. My son and I flew over to watch this game against the Rattlers and the Sabercats. Great receiver, you know, makes a difference in the first half, breaks his nose. And now the thing is, for me, I, you know, I haven't played any pro professional level or anything, but I played basketball or something in high school. I hit my nose barely, and my eyes are running, and my nose is running, and everything yeah. and stuff. This guy breaks his nose, and it comes back in the second half. Was that two touchdowns? One. It was one, one touchdown. It was a touchdown that actually. Yeah, that was a, that was a definitive comeback. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's all I have to say. That's. Uh, I mean, that really, it's like that. That attitude and that um, identity. That you guys had that year, with what you did coming back, like I think it kind of sums up that whole identity that you guys ran with that whole year, right? Adversity yeah. and everything and stuff. So that's and, all I got. And say. just uh, for people who are knowing that about that game, that's um, the Arena Bowl was an eighteen in two thousand four that played at the at then America West Arena, which has changed name. It's now called Talking Stick Resort Arena because U.S. Airways was purchased by you know American Airlines, so the U.S. American Airlines already has two arenas, one in Dallas, one in Miami, so they can't do a third. Oh, that must be nice. Right? Yeah, it must be nice. Well, a lot of people I don't really know the story behind that. <laughs> After I got my nose broken, realized that it was broken. Uh -huh. Doctor Ting checked my nose. Uh, he tried to put it back in place. Uh -huh. and he said, "You're going to have to have surgery." Yeah. So he said, "But I can give you a shot." So. We're on one side of the locker room. He walks over to the opposite side of the locker room uh -huh. to get a, a needle to give me a shot. Yeah. I hear the cannon go off. Boom! Uh. I'm like, oh. The Everybody's hollering. Arizona yeah. the scores. I grab my helmet. And just give me in. Give I, me just, I just leave the uh, locker room. He yeah. had no idea I left. Oh. When I came onto the field, everybody from Arizona was walking down, you know, hyping up the crowd. Yeah. And then when they looked at me, I don't know if you guys remember this. It was uh -huh. like the arena went quiet and everybody from San Jose erupted when they seen me walk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that, yeah. And, then, yeah. and, that, and, I, and I was so uh, mad at the yeah, time. It, yeah. the, the Rattlers looked like they saw a ghost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and That's I, what I they mean, saw. I was extremely That's pissed because then I realized I got punched in my nose and yeah. it wasn't on the board. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was the story behind that. But I was determined to come back and, and uh, you know, that was the last game. But the thing is, you know, like, this, this whole game, and I mean, even on you know the NFL and, and a lot of sports, right? This this is a momentum game, right? Yep. And it's a mind game. So if your if your teammates see you come on the field like that, and if Arizona's teammates see you come on the field and everything, I mean that's inspiring. What that says is that's like you know what, you can break our bones, you can break our nose, right. and we're gonna come out. And for you to score those touchdowns and everything, big momentum. I mean, I can just. I mean, I've never played in the field, but I can just imagine. I mean, you, you can see. You see things happen and everything. The whole attitude changed when you came out in the second half. It went from, like, Arizona to, like, San Jose, right? So, Chuck Reed made a that. comment. He said, when I went out of the game, he said, man, we're going to lose. And he said, he seen me walk onto the field. He goes, okay, we're going to win. Yeah. 
and that was before you know I even, you know got back into play. So oh, yeah, yeah. that was that was huge. But I felt that as long as I could move and I can see, and I can tolerate the pain. You yeah. know, I need to get back out there. You know, and we worked on a particular play that Arizona. They knew exactly what we were going to do according to the formation. Uh-huh. So we just changed instead of me yeah. running across the field. I ran downfield and yeah, that was it. So, so, that's so that arena, great that arena ring for that year was a little extra special for you, right? That was very yeah, yeah. That was extra special. Then yeah. they started calling me, you know, Willis Reed and so on <laughs> and so forth. And yeah, and also, especially going into Arizona, yeah, like you guys did, went at the last minute. And I think uh, was it Hunky Cooper? Hunky Cooper. Hunky Cooper. Yes, he was. Yeah, I just remember. Uh, I remember the highlights of, the, of that game. Yeah, I still. I have the highlight, highlights of that game on my hard drive, yeah. my, my old computer, back when I got the highlights of the NBC yeah. Sports there, and I also got the one on ABC Sports when we played um, Arizona at the Compact Center in 2002, and I have the picture of um, Jerry Reese catching the touchdown pass and you know climbing to up, 14. climbing up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then the Arizona Rattlers didn't score until nine minutes left in the game. Yeah. Oh, that was a complete beatdown. I yeah. don't even. I don't think Arizona showed up that day. No, it was 30, 28 nothing at halftime. I believe. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, it was. It was over with at halftime. But, yeah. yeah, but you know, like the the game that you were in in Arizona, I remember um, Cedric Bonner. He was crying. You know, he had his. I mean, because he gave his heart, right? He did. And a lot of players they gave their heart, and to to lose like that. And it's out of your control and to like be so close to grasping that championship in your own home. I mean, you know how special that would be. And you know, he already lost to, to, to you guys once. So I just I was feeling for him. I mean, you know, Cedric Bonner, from what I've seen, great guy. He's not cocky. Yeah, he's a great guy. Great, good announcer and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when I saw him right there on the side, I was right there and stuff, and he was just he was you know he couldn't hold the emotion in because he left his I heart rem- to I remember that. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess it's one of the biggest things for me that we can move on is that playing in that league to be acknowledged by other great athletes on you know throughout the league yeah you know um talking about how hard i was to cover and you know from the beginning of the game to the end of the game it, it looked like the first quarter it looked like the fourth quarter like yeah. you know they i was relentless and they hated that yeah. but they gave me the utmost respect so yeah. and that was something that i always wanted to be i wanted to be somebody that you had the game plan i wanted to be like jerry rice yeah and you know i I got that. I got, got that, that wish. The wish came true, and I, I made made the best of it. So. Yeah. Well, you know, like what you say, being respected from the best of the best. I mean that that really says something. That's it. So. Yeah, I want to bring up the question now that a lot of a lot of um, let's just say outlookers out there, you know, and I'll get one of the questions I'll get to you is probably in competition <laughs> to Steve Watson, this goat, you know. <laughs> but we'll get that into a section uh, in, in in a minute. And then, of course, we'll transition into having what's going on today with, with David here um, as we work through the timeline going from early to present time. Um, but before you, the, the Sabercats, you were also with the Cincinnati Bengals. Right. So right. you've had your experience on the on the wide open field that is the NFL. Definitely. How was your transition going from the NFL open space to the closed narrowness of the arena and then also dealing with the, the one defensive player that you never expected to to uh, win against, and that's the wall. <laughs> yeah, you never <laughs> win against the wall. Uh, I, I say the hardest part for me was learning how to create space for myself as a receiver within the confines of you know the, the in, you know the indoor field. Yeah. Um, once I began to understand how to create space, and I have to give all that credit to um, Terry Malley. Yeah. I mean, he was great at showing me how to work people and basically tying in my speed Mm -hmm. and the mindset that I already had as a professional athlete and the experience of how to work guys, Mm -hmm. you know, was, uh, was a great combination. It didn't take, it didn't take long because, uh, once frustration sets in for me every day after practice, I would go home and walk out routes in my apartment. Wow. You know, uh, you know, just basically practicing my steps on and so forth. So that was like the hardest transition, but and that was 2001, yeah. and we almost went to the Arena Bowl that yeah. year. Yeah. We lost yeah. to the Nashville Cats, yeah. Yeah. you know, beating Arizona. Those other to cats. The other, to the other cats, exactly. They're the, they're the wannabe country version of the Sabercats, and they called their dance team the Kittens there, too. Oh, I did. Yeah. yeah I, I, I didn't like that. I didn't, I, that was a <laughs> yeah. horrible place was to play like, as well in Nashville. Well, the, the Pyramid? 
when they I, called it then? I can't remember the but name. I, that was that wow. It was 2001. Geez. Yeah, I think that wow. was the pyramid because yeah. Memphis has FedEx Forum where the um, the Memphis Grizzlies play. That's right. Yeah. And that's a new arena because the Grizzlies from the NBA transferred from the GM place in Vancouver, Washington, or Vancouver, British Columbia. When they had the two teams in the NBA. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so it was right. Vancouver and, and Toronto Raptors. They came in at the same time to have, you know, NBA trying to do Canada and all their arenas they have they used for hockey. So they tried those two cities, and the GM place was the host for the the Grizzlies, Vancouver Grizzlies at the time, up north of Seattle Sonics. And then they sold the team or whatever, and then that's when they moved over to Memphis, and that's where they are now. And part of their ownership group is a celebrity named by the name of Justin Timberlake. Oh, wow. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Well, you yeah. remember the team that they had in Toronto yeah. as well. For oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Toronto Pharaohs. Yeah. 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 I think we played them like once. Yeah. Once we, or twice there. Yeah. So, so, like, adding kind of to what you said about having to take your game from, like, a wide open field to the confines of an arena and also adding to, you know, as far as receivers, I think we all remember, uh, was it Roe? Yes. And slammed into the end zone one of the poles. Yeah. You know, the hazards of the arena. I mean, yeah, in the NFL, you get the hazards of the cameraman when you're knocking into the cameraman and knocking into poles here and there and everything. But, man, just everything just being, like, right there. So would you say that Terry Malley, because you know how they say, like, Phil Walls in the NFL, he knew where everyone was going to be exactly saying, okay, if this doesn't develop, then this person should be here by this time. Mm-hmm. So was Terry Malley, and I know it's a lot wider, but was that to where you had to, like, plan A, plan B, this person's going to be here, this person... And I know the quarterbacks, from the quarterback perspective, the game has to slow down for them when they come from the wide open field down to the small. And I'm sure it's the same with you guys, right? Actually, it actually, it's, it, it, you, you really can't slow it down in, indoors. It yeah. actually speeds up. The advantage I had coming in, being a veteran of the league, is the ball's coming out a lot faster in the NFL. Yeah. You, like you say, you're running your route, you come across the middle, the ball's already there. You're yeah. running to catch the ball. So yeah. it was easy to make that adjustment. But Terry was very good at creating situations, you know, high-low situations on the front or the back side that the offensive specialist, you know, had to create. So my position was very imperative, but whoever played that offensive special position, which made that offense go. Uh-huh. Um, i say one of the greatest compliments was Terry Malley actually having his own offense, and you and he has strict rules. Uh-huh. The offense specialist, you had to do this. If the guy has sky, you have to go inside. You have to go inside. And so you almost have to predict where the defenders are going to be. You almost have to read their minds before the play even starts. Right? Actually, you watching the backside corner. Uh-huh. Whatever whatever position that that backside corner is doing uh-huh. will dictate what the safety is going to do uh, okay. if he backs off late or if he comes, comes up late. Yeah. So there was a, a situation where he said, well, if they have sky coverage when the safety comes down and catches him in the line of scrimmage, uh-huh. you have to go inside. Yeah. And I got frustrated because... Once you get pushed inside, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. The linebacker bumps you. Yeah. So I remember one game, I just I went outside and I beat the guy so bad. Reed was surprised. <laughs> Threw a touchdown. Yeah. And from that point on, <laughs> we were in practice. After the meetings, he said, okay, everybody has to go inside except for Hunden. Hunden, you have a two-way go. <laughs> wow. And so that's what evolved and made, yeah. made us who we were yeah. as, as a team because – he allowed me to do what I needed to do to get downfield because I had the speed. And yeah. I think nice. that nice. Terry Malley had a, a an easy way to transition the wide receivers from like James Hunden's outdoor game experience to the indoor because Terry Malley himself coached um, the Broncos in the outdoor game. Right. Sure the, the team's no longer yeah. exist in Santa Clara. Yeah. The Broncos there that played at Buckshaw. Yeah. You know, and Where, uh, Brent so, Jones came from. Yeah, Brent Jones. Right. Not, not your son. Yeah. Yeah, my son's Brett Jones, by the way. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I used to be a big Niners fan, in case you didn't notice. And, and your dad, oh, right. and I had to make it famous because I'm. Yeah, my dad's Jerry Jones, and of course yeah, I'm Tom Jones. So oh, I guess I got to keep. Had to, you got to keep. I had to keep everything going, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, going from the outdoor game in the NFL, and now transitioning now that you've had experiences of both leagues, um, how can you say? Hey, can you, because you know we're Ninth Man Nation, so you know Ninth Man universal term from the home team crowd. Like you have like the NFL is the 12th man. I know Seattle is trying to capitalize on that that their idea. They did not start it. Seattle Seahawks did not start it. Actually started in Minnesota at the 
at the, no, you know... Texas Tech. Was it Texas no, Tech? was it Texas? It was oh. a combination between either Texas or Minnesota that did the, the 12-man thing there. But it's yeah. still a universal team because you got 11 players on the field, whether it's college or NFL or whatever, and then the 12-man is your home team crowd. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing and in, and the, in the refs, football. sometimes the are we not going to go there? We're not going to talk about the refs. That's, <laughs> that's a whole other team. That, that's a zoo. Yeah. <laughs> that's why they're zebras. Right. You know, um, but... Um, Going to from the NFL, how was your fan relationship experience in the NFL with the Bengals, and or just in the NFL, even when you're on the road, as compared to the AFL and the Ninth Man? Well, you know the NFL being such a, a prominent league, you know fans are fixated on particular players. Um, the amazing thing is, you don't think that you're really known, but you actually have particular people that know who you are. So that was. That was uh, interesting for me, you know, kind of making a little name for myself. You know, you start making plays, and people start recognize you. Like, okay, this underdog here is coming in, and he compliments the system well. You know, he's just as good, you yeah. know, as uh, Darnay Scott or Carl Pickens in his own way. So that that was great, but nothing compares to the Arena League fans. I mean, to be in that close proximity, being able to give you feel like you're in the field. You oh, feel like I you're mean, in the field. they're right there and. They're calling your name. You get hit up against the wall. You're giving them high fives. You know, just the interaction. And the biggest compliment I could get was to see people wearing my jersey. Oh, yeah. That right there, I, yeah. you know, I was I was blown away. Like, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, dude. I was on a budget then. I was just barely starting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 2000 was my first year even getting season tickets. Oh, I mean, they were, it, it, was, it was so fun. And then, yeah. then to go I and mean, be around the city of San Jose and like, people recognize me. Yeah. Especially after... Um, the second arena bowl because oh, I'm walking yeah. around with this oh, cast yeah, yeah. on my nose yeah. Yeah. and people stop me talking about I just want to tell you that was one hell of a game you played yeah. and just shake my hand so it, I mean this you, you can't you can't compare the two it's totally yeah. different well also I always look at the NFL as very commercialized right so like you have like nowadays especially like NFL you have a lot of people that are going just because so they can check in on their Facebook right and say hey I was there especially in the games or whatever but like when people go to the arena, they go for the love of the game. When players play for the arena, it's the love of the game. Now, of course, you know, you're always hoping that you get that big shot, right, for the NFL and That's everything, right. but you're not coming to the arena league to be, you know, getting a new crib, right, like a big old huge right. house or whatever, right? You, you're for the love of the game, right? Exactly, the love of the so game. It, so I think it actually has passionate players, and it's like comparing, like, NFL players in general right. to arena players, coaches, and everything, you know, you feel like, you know what, hey, that guy, I can relate to that guy more. I can relate to this other person, this superstar. And, you know, that superstar in the NFL might be great and everything. It might be a good guy and this and that and everything. But, you know, it's like the blue-collar players. Exactly. It's a blue-collar league, so it's like you can relate to those people. I think when you look at the money that the NFL makes compared to what Arena makes, and remember, there was an article back 2001, 2002, and they talked about how a lot of us had secondary jobs after the season. Like, I work for the probation department, you yeah. know, the Youth Guidance oh, yeah. Center in yeah. San Mateo. Yeah, San Mateo. You know, I had to supplement yeah. my income the yeah. rest of the year. Yeah. So, you're right, to being able to identify with us as, you know, these are normal, hardworking guys that's busting their butt out here playing football, and I can have some type of relationship with them. And so, I think it was it was very creative for the, uh, the AFL to... Uh, come up with the AFL and then combine that and create that atmosphere where it's uh, you know, thank, thank player you and friendly. Yeah. How many jobs did you need when you were in the XFL? God. <laughs> yeah, we didn't bring that up. If you didn't win, you don't get paid. Right? We, wow. didn't, we didn't bring that up. Yeah, that James also played for the San Francisco, well, was supposed to be originally San Jose Demons at Spartan Stadium, but AT&T Park or Pac Bell Park back then. Say, hey, yeah. we got this brand new Mother of a home for anything, even though yeah. we originally didn't want Is football. That what happened? Yeah, yeah. They start, it was the San Jose Demons. I was this close from making a trip down to the ticket office to buy season tickets to that because it's San Jose, and then then they boom went to San Francisco because Pac Bell Parks it. They want them there. Well, I think Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon. He, he was he was star trek. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the old dilapidated, you know, Spartan Stadium. You know, be the first group to ever play football in that stadium, which was us. I mean, oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. was cool. But and then yeah, he, had, new, he, had a, he had to wear Maybe it wasn't set up for football. You were on, but they were able to pack you were on the, the You were the SI guy. Cool, yeah, 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 Sports yeah. Illustrated. Yeah. That, 
A lot of people don't know. Um, I got my bell rung in that picture, too. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you don't see the safety yeah. that's, that oh. when I'm in the air and he's right there. <laughs> right. He, oh, he laid me out. Oh, but man. that that was well, I think you, interesting by, lead. Just by you playing for the Demons in, in San Francisco and then the number you chose for your jersey, people would put a target on you, number 80. They did. Yeah. <laughs> they, they definitely put a, they put a target on me. They said, you better be just as good wearing that number. <laughs> I'm saying I mean, today, well, that's yeah. also like you know, in, in the in you know Northern California football, you got the Oakland Raiders number 16 as the quarterback Plunkett, right? San Francisco 49ers number 16 Joe Montana, everybody knows that, and then now with SaberCats number 16 Mark Reeb, yeah. So 16 was a magical number, oh yeah, you know, and, yeah, and cool. everybody had to live up the standards of those the other two <laughs> quarterbacks. So you know, so now we've transitioned, you know, from time. Let's go in a little bit. Let's have some fun with this, but what? I know the rules were different. Players played differently. Step by step, the tr- league transitioned into what it is now: free substitution and two way or one way, you know, all that stuff. But who do you think is the goat? I'm the gonna, Cats. I'm going to tell you, as far as the year. Yeah, I'm going. I'm, I'm hands down. I'm going to say the 2002. Sounds like Saber Cats. Did you hear that, Steve Watson? Because I know you listen to the show, Mr. Executive Vice President. What was that? <laughs> yeah, you said well, 2007, what they blew out the team in the Arena Bowl. Yeah, the Columbus Destroyers. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think that was yeah. more of a blowout as compared to, you know, the 2002 Rattlers. That's our arch rivals, and that's before the conference difference, you know. Yeah. You played Arena Bowl in the same conference. But it was, but but the, the rules were still the same. 2007, I think they did some rule changes. They still had the two-way players, and I think they had the two-way players, but I think they got rid of the Iron Man. And oh, then oh, in 2008, right. that's when they went to both getting rid of the two the, the two-way play, and they went to free substitution. Well, I'll just make a plain and clear: you can't you can't compare a team from that era to the new rule changes that they made in the Arena League. No, now, I, no, no, no disrespect to the 2015 Arena Bowl champion San Jose SaberCats. Awesome. I mean, it's not easy Only to win. Armstrong, right? Not not easy to win at all to win yeah. a championship. So I, I applaud them, but you cannot you cannot compare that team to 2002 when you can have free substitutions mm-hmm. and put a whole complete offense and defense and people to you know cover kicks and return kicks on the field. Yeah. You just basically brought the outdoor game indoors. indoors. Yeah. Now, as I explained before, when you have two-way receivers playing DB receiver. You have your offensive line that have to play defense. Right. You think about it. If you have an offensive guy that's all he's done is played the offensive line all his life and he has to learn how to play defense too, you know, so it's a learning curve. And you, you have to be very, very tough, not only physically but mentally. Yeah. You know, so All your life you've been going this way and now you're going this right. way. You have to change your mentality. Yeah. Now. It's, it's a different form of thinking. Yeah. You know, it's not just I can go out on offense and just do offense. The great thing is to have being an offensive specialist, that's all I had to do. Yeah. Defensive specialist, that's all he had to do. So you, you basically have your two best players going yeah. at it. Wow. Who's going to win? Yeah. Okay. And then whoever wins out of that, who, which one of the two secondary secondary players are going to make that play? Yeah. And they're exhausted. Yeah. You know, so who are they looking at? Me. Because all I do is sit there and wait for my turn. Yeah. I have no choice but to go, yeah. you know, 100 miles an hour every play. Yeah. That's, that's the mentality I have. So, you know. Hey, 2015, congratulations, it's great, but you can't compare the stats to Mark Green and the quarterback now. You can't, you can't, you know, compare the stats to myself and the receiver that had X amount of touchdowns. Plus, the whole league had different players back then. Similar rules, but some rule changes. And I think the you caliber just, of player really, back then was more equivalent and more spread equally around than seeing being bulked up on these so-called high horse teams that was like Philadelphia, San Jose, Arizona. Yeah. You know, and, and Jacksonville that were the high horses of the league this last year. And the age factor. Yeah. Back when I played, we had a lot, of, throughout the whole league, you had a lot of older players in their 30s. Yeah. Late 20s, 30s. Probably, probably going in their 40s playing. Yeah. Now you have a bunch of young young kids that's out here playing out of high school. You know, yeah. first out of college, I would say, you know, um, Maybe got a chance in the NFL for training camp, didn't make it, so they're trying to play arena football. Yeah. It's a, it's a younger generation. So we, Sam Hernandez, he's about 137 years old. <laughs> he, but, lives, yeah. right he lives right down the street. Yeah. But he <laughs> balled his tail off. Michael Lafale. Yeah. And he went through his tri- uh, tribulations with um, 
with uh, Mark Reed to being with um, the Las Vegas Sting and uh, then transition to the Anaheim Piranhas, unfortunately playing under David Baker for the Piranhas. Well, you know, uh, also Mark Reed played for the uh, Las Vegas Outlaws. Yeah, in, yeah, in, uh, XFL. Uh, XFL, yeah. too. Yeah. So, yeah. No, here's an interesting story. What's that? Mark Grieve knew about me because he was the quarterback for UC Davis when they came up to Portland State. Ah, okay. uh, We had a conversation. <laughs> Aggies versus room. Vikings. Oh, yeah. he said, man, I just remember watching you, James, and you just, like, torched our DBs. So their two starting DBs got hurt. Uh, they start some red shirt freshmen. Yeah. We got that news. We were like, red shirt freshmen. <laughs> Antonio Chandler went 11 for 255. I went 8 for 225. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. he, he, he clearly remembered that game. So when he got the opportunity to play with me, he, he said he knew, gosh, if we can get a, get this Somebody connection like, yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the greatest conversation we've ever, ever been a part of was saying that Grieve and I was like the most prolific pass-catch duo, and he combined it with uh, Young Rice. Yeah, you yeah. know, just to be yeah. in that same. Remember that? Yeah. Just to be in that same sentence yeah. was like, oh yeah, wow, you know, that's huge. But. Yeah. You know what the thing is? Is that's that moment in time that's captured, right? It's like all the planets are aligned in a certain way and stuff. That's never going to happen exactly that way. Like when you guys were doing that. Same thing, like when the you know, like early the first the first arena bowl, as opposed to like 2015. Every situation is different. You know? It's like for that moment in time, you guys were the best at your game. And you guys were on, yeah, in sync with with each other. You had you had a lot of veteran players that understood the importance of, of football, yeah. and it's not about the individuals, about the team. That's mm-hmm. that's what I love about that. I say that's the best team I've ever been associated with. Was the Sounds of Silver Cast? We were like a family. Yeah. No disrespect to the other teams that yeah. I played with, but I was it was very close. Yeah. You know, you got talked about on the practice field. You know, of course, that was the first championship, right? Yeah, That's you know, right? you're joking around with people. So I mean, yeah. so it was, it was a great environment, a great atmosphere to be a part of. You know, so yeah, sixteen thousand fans, yeah, packed arena. Oh, and now I don't know if you remember this stat. Every coin toss, well, how many games was it that year? Was it sixteen? Sixteen? Sixteen games? It was fourteen. Fourteen games. Fourteen and then, really? Yeah, yeah, fourteen oh, games, yeah. and then the playoff, and the yeah. Arena Bowl. Do you know out of those 14 games, we won tw- uh, I think, 13 out of 14 coin tosses? It was something like that. Yeah. Th- th- Syracuse would always win the, the coin toss. They always kick I think we lost the one time. Yeah. That makes a difference. That's that, a big controversy in yeah. the NFL now. You yeah. know, people are saying, hey, you know what? Uh, that coin toss they did. Because yeah, you didn't flip the coin. <laughs> yeah. It's it like just, you, the offense didn't even have a chance to get, a, you know, like, you know how the NFL, they always want to go to the college rules. Right. Because of the fact that when you flip that coin, you may not always get a chance to go out there and prove yourself, right? If the other team scores a touchdown. Yeah, and that, that rule, that rule is hor- that's a horrible rule. It's, yeah. un- it's unfair. Yeah. It's unfair. Give give them a chance to score. If they don't score, hey, yeah. you win. So now we want we sort of want to transition to because we want to get um, you know David in the conversation here. So just a quick thought, last minute thought, that um, what do you think of how you – think the, the 2015 did. Did you go, first of all, did you go into any of the games? I didn't get a chance to make it to 2015. Of course, being a, a bus driver now for AC Transit, um, working weekends, it was oh, yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. hard to get off, you know, oh, yeah. to work. And he's had I, many I, opportunities to, to migrate his bus driving duties to VTA <laughs> and get a little more penny in his pocket, you know, you know, but, you know, and now, but then you would have to work the Super Bowl that's coming up here. You know, <laughs> transition because it's all hands on deck, and I'm like, I want to go to Vegas that weekend. Just my chance, you know. I don't want oh, to be anywhere yeah. near that stadium. Then I wouldn't be able to participate in the NFL Players Association function that I got invited. Oh, to. So, nice, you nice. Know, in San Francisco. Uh, hey, nice. Buddy, do you have an extra ticket? No. <laughs> you know, I, you know Pop, I told Pops, I, you know, I was actually, you know, signing him up, and then yeah. he called me, and I said, Guess what? We're uh, going to this. Nice. I just got this email, so it'd be nice to him in the game. <laughs> No, actually, um, it's uh, the NFL Players Association has a function that's going on in uh, on Market Street. Oh, at the Super Bowl City? Yes. I'll probably see you there. So we'll be um, at this place. I can't remember the address right now, but um, Friday night from 6 p.m. to 11, you know, Saturday from 6 p.m. to 11, and Sunday, the viewing party from 2.30 to like 8. Wow, nice. You know, so. That's a good opportunity. Do you run in any uh, former, uh, I'm sure you, over the years, you've, Played or you've been involved in some capacity to all these players that you'll probably just you probably run into them just like at these oh, just kind of a events, lot of the right? old players. Yeah, yeah. it'll be good. Yeah. It'll be good to see them. Yeah. Well, a lot of people will probably try and reach out to me because I'm Bay Area. Oh yeah, you yeah. know. But yeah. I, I live like nice. ten to fifteen minutes away from Levi's, so 
I said, you just take two streaks. Uh, I'm not going to be around. <laughs> I'm going, Levi's is over there? Okay, I'm going over there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, like I was telling you, for, you know, I'm going to be I'm gonna be covering every event the week awesome. of. <clears throat> but they already told me on, on Super Bowl Sunday, they recommend that I get to the stadium at 5 a.m. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. Homeland wow. Security. And it's, what time does the game start? Shutting down. Um, was it three something? I think yeah. it's like three usually three in the four Pacific. o'clock, something like yeah, that. Yeah, usually in the, in the West Coast it's three. I don't, I don't understand why I have to get there so early because the NFL isn't allowing anybody to tailgate. Yeah, no, they have a, they have a, just a VIP tailgate they built there in the Great America Park. Well, they, they have that. And Great America is supposed to be open that day too. I think. I think. Really? You during, think maybe they're just during, telling during, people fly? during Forty Nine ers season they um, well, they told the media to get there. But like, do you think they're just saying five because they know everyone's going to probably get yeah, there at eight yeah, or yeah. You know, later? Well, the you know, if you remember, they had the stadium series there last year, yeah. and that was supposed to be the test run. Uh, right, the first, yeah. the first test run. The second one was WrestleMania. Yeah, and they actually put more people in the stadium for WrestleMania than there will be for the well, Super Bowl. Yeah, because they could yeah. fill the field with exactly. some seats. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I, I was in Cambridge. I, I really wanted to go to WrestleMania because I never got to experience one. Do you know what twins? But uh, yeah, and that too. But <laughs> I, I was in, I was in Cambridge, but I heard that. I mean, I remember being at the stadium series and uh, walking out. I offered to give my dad a ride home. He lives in Campbell, and he had, he had taken the light rail. And I remember looking at the, the light rail platform, and there was like a VTA employee standing on a soapbox with a looked like a concentration camp or something. She was giving it <laughs> looked like Auschwitz, you know, yeah. intake or something. I'm like, you sure you want to? Train home in that? Nah. <laughs> you know? So it's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be crazy. Yeah. And then they said that. Well, it's a fiftieth. The 50th well, there's like a they originally wanted right? Homeland yeah. Security originally wanted you know a mile radius as the first cutoff, and then the second one was gonna be two miles. And and the people are like, hold up, wait a second. We live right here. This is our yeah. household. Yeah. We have to go to the grocery store. We have to do this yeah. on a daily life. We don't care about the NFL. We just have to do well, this. The, the NFL, you and, know, and to and quote to quote concussion. The NFL owns a day of the week. Yeah. That the oh, yeah. church they used, do. that the church used to own. Yeah. Now it's yeah. theirs, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so true even though we're not here talking about the NFL, we just had that little brief. That's we want this show to be completely AFL. NFL doesn't exist. We just use, you know, a little general topic, but to make the transition now we're gonna talk about David. Um, he, like we said at the beginning of the show, he works um, he contributes for the examiner dot com, which is a San Francisco uh, newspaper, the online version, you know how basically everything's going online nowadays. So he's got his foot in the right side of the door, not doing oh, yeah. printed. He's going to online. Yeah. If people want to print them out, there's a little printer icon on the top. You click it, and it gives you a printable view. <laughs> right. So go ahead, David. Talk talk about it and talk your um, – just give a little background on what you've done yeah. and, so, and the reason why you've transitioned to covering the AFL. Well, you know, I, when I was growing up, I grew up in, in the Grieve era, you know, with the, uh, the three original Arena Bowls. And awesome. uh, after, after high school – when I when I you know went to college, I kind of just migrated away from arena football. You know, I I first started before I've been the NHL was the first sport that I before I've been playing hockey since I was three years old. But you know, uh, the, just this last season, I had a friend who was a season ticket holder, and uh, he asked me if I if I'd come to a game with him, and I said, you know, why not? It's a Saturday night. You know, I enjoyed myself. It was probably the first arena football game that I had attended in at least a decade. You know, or more. Um, I think the last time I was watching was during the 2004 championship. Yeah. And um, I had a good time, so I ended up going to a, a couple of more. And the the latter half of those two two more that I went to, I think at that point that they were nine and zero. Yeah. I think is what they were. And you know, I just approached my editor and I said, "There's a team here that's winning a lot of games. It's having." An almost unprecedented season, you know, and uh, maybe we should give them some coverage, you know. And this is actually when I was with I was with Fox Sports at the time. I I wasn't with Examer yet, and uh, you know, my editor, in, in a in a typical fashion, um, nobody watches arena football, you know. He, in so many words, he told me, you know, you can cover the team, but I'm not going to pay you for it. So I said, all right, whatever, you know. And I emailed. Uh, Mike Carrazzo, I think is yeah, the, Mike you know, and he, I got access and I just started uh, started covering the team from uh, the first loss of the season, ironically, all the way through the Arena Bowl. Damn, the Kiss. Yeah, against the Kiss. Um, yeah. And I just uh, covered the team for the rest of the year. That was a lucky overtime. Yeah. And, um, you know, after the, um, throughout the season I developed 
a few contacts within the organization and within the league during the week of the Arena Bowl and the, and the playoffs that came before it. And uh, when I heard that there was turmoil um, and that there was a possibility that you know the AFL might kick off a new season without its defending champions, and I saw nobody else reporting on it, I just started digging in, you know, as, as I feel every good reporter should. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah. Well, that's good. Um, you know, we appreciate that because just over the years, the AFL has been kind of like the secondary, right? Because yes. everyone knows about the NFL, right? Or not but even not secondary, a lot of people. The third, yeah, the but NCAA is yeah, also. Yeah. And, you know, it's like you've had leagues over the over the course of the you know years, but of course, I don't think the AFL directly competes against the NFL. In fact, there's an opportunity for them to find the NFL to find this league as a seed, you know, for for the for the larger games because you have more all around athletes. That can kind of go both ways. It's just kind of a, it's a different kind of flavor of a player. So to hear what you you were trying to do, you recognize that hey, this is a league, this team's winning, and then the turmoil, of course, you know, being around since the '80s. If what is it, the the, the longest running league competing that's been around for that long? Wow. That's the statistic? Yeah, I mean, nothing else is nothing else. Is, I mean, the XFL lasted it's one come year. Come and go, come and go. I mean, one the, year, the, yeah. the IFL. Yeah has been around for a while, but I mean, the AFL is the only other football league that has a TV contract and yada, 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 you know? Yeah. Do you want another semester? Well, you remember in 2002, we didn't really start getting coverage until the 12th game. Oh. ABC yeah. Sports. Yeah. And then we yeah. lost uh, to Arizona yeah. that night. And you know, who, you know who the sideline reporter was for the Arena Bowl that year? Ben Swan. Oh, yeah. He yeah. sure was. Yeah. yeah. ABC the, Sports. Yeah, he the, was. The main, reason, the main reason that I approached my editor at the time and solicited, you know, coverage was because the last time before this last season that I had gone to an arena football league game, I remember the only difference between a Sharks game and a Sabercats game at, I think it was the Compact Center at the time, was was the playing service. I mean, there were 15, 16,000 strong yeah, at yeah, those yeah. games. Yeah, yeah. And, and coming back, Last season, I was like, you know, I played, I played in, I played in high school hockey games that had larger crowds. Yeah, last year also there was a difference because uh, one, the SaberCats were not on TV unless they were on national TV. Yeah. And the reason why was CSN wanted Buku Bucks for that, and, and the yeah. Fry family said, you know, it's not worth it at this time to do that C- kind of thing. CSN, yeah. CSN, yeah. Well, so, uh, and Comcast. Well, the, so long story short was, you know, coming back, the, the product I felt was still just as exciting, Yeah. you know, and I enjoyed myself just as much as an adult as I did when I was a kid, so I figured, you know, what the hell if, if well, I write the, a couple when the, of... When the, the, the cats came back in 2011, they had everybody else in place. They basically, everybody had was on their bucket, you know, a quick call list, quick dial list. From when it was back in 2008, so they hired the same game day operations guy, Kenny. You know, who unfortunately did the Rattlers too with his company. And I've seen him done something with for the Utah, you know, Jazz NBA team too. Yeah. I just figured if I wrote a couple of columns, that if nothing else, would get more, See, but more butts in the seats. Yeah. What I appreciate, appreciate just that. as as me as running the fan club, and I've tried working with media outlets. I've tried contacting them. I mean, I feel as even I would think when the Cats came back. KPIX, CBS 5 in San Francisco reached out to me to get a hold of our bet to have them on on their Sunday day show. So it was like, that's great. I've been interviewed a few times on Channel 4, Cron. I've been interviewed on Channel 7, uh, ABC's local, to get the, the, the fan response to what was going on with like the former passing of Johnny Kirk. Oh, yeah. You know, and unfortunately, oh, re- rest in peace, you know, he's, he was a great guy and he only was with the cast for like, like, a less than a week after being traded oh, from Arizona. Yeah, I remember that story. So yeah. number thirty-seven. Right. So and of course, as fans, as you can see, the strong relationship between the fans and the players of their respective teams. That we went out was both myself and another uh, fan, Rhonda. She went out and she made some, you know, pins that had his number and his name. And I made some bracelets and I gave them out to the entire players. I even sent a whole bunch. Um, the player personnel guy sent got like a small little bag. And sent him a whole bunch up to um, to the Seattle area where he was from for his family. So you know, it's like a relationship. And from what like what David was saying, you know, saying going to a game and say, hey, something needs to be done, and follow up that this needs to be recognized. I appreciate what David has done because I truly think the AFL needs 
the media attention it deserves. You got players that go out there and if not get the same kind of injuries or put the same kind of heart they do in the big outdoor game, whether it be NCAA, whether it be the upstart of the USFL that was supposed to go or the or the, the San Jose Rush that was supposed to be starting at some American Football League or whatever it was and then XFL and a lot of stuff. That's all money conglomerate, but the players put their effort in. Well, I think also, I think also, you know, we live in a pretty football crazed nation, where yeah. you know the only thing you would be really surprised if you look at the TV ratings. The NFL, of course, leads; it's king. You know, the NFL is the most watched product in the entire country. NASCAR is number two. And a lot of people would think it might be basketball, or it might be football, or it might be baseball. I'm sorry, basketball or baseball or hockey. It goes NFL. And then NASCAR, and then I think it's almost four or five percent. The next one's the NBA. But you know, this is a football crazed country, and, and the Arena Football League offers, I feel at least, I mean, you know, I cover the Niners. Yeah. So I can tell you that at least this season, I, I, I much more enjoyed covering the Sabercats <laughs> last season than I did covering the Niners this season. Yeah. You know, um, and it's not just about the product on the field, it was the people that I worked with in the organization, yeah. the players, you know. But, you know, it's a football crazy nation, and the AFL was offering a product that was, you know, of more economic means. Yeah, more family-oriented. You know, more family-oriented, and, and it was it's faster. Yeah. It's a unique game, you know. It's a unique game, and also our people are putting too much thought into the fact that the AFL truly competes with the NFL. It does not. Well, yeah. The UFL, the United Football yeah, League, when they did, came out, USFL, yeah. the yeah. USFL, the UFL, and the NFL, they all compete because they all wanted to start their league on the same seasons as the NFL thing. So basically, the the late summer to winter you know, league, fall, you, you winter. Remember, you remember the greatest game that nobody ever saw, the Steve Young, Jim Kelly, USFL game. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, you can get that, I think. On the uh, internet, yeah, That's you can get anything on on YouTube. They had like twelve hundred passing yards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a good shootout. thing. Good thing you were playing a secondary. <laughs> oh, so yeah. my my thought yeah, to continue not. on that. My thought is that if you are a true, honest fan of the sport of football, okay, the sport of football, the NFL is one game of football. The yeah. AFL is another game of football. Yeah. Okay. If you're a true fan of the sport of football. You wouldn't mind there being truly year-round football. Well, also, just to add to that, is during the height of the league, San Jose Arena, they were packing fans, right? And this is in a market that already has two professional football teams. Right. So you figured there's enough fans left over, and there's probably not a whole lot. I'm guessing that there's not all, the same season ticket holders. There's probably season ticket holders that are not season ticket holders in the NFL that are just primarily season ticket holders in the got, NFL, let, right? let's say So there's enough fans to go around, which really, that kind of yeah, tells you Yeah, let's say, like for that. example, like when the Sabercats started out, it was still Candlestick Park for the 49ers. Um, every single seat in Candlestick Park was a season ticket holder, okay? Let's just say, for example, that would be like, well, at 65000 okay? Right. Then you go over to Oakland Coliseum, and you say, before the Mount Davis remodel, you say every single seat was an Oakland Raiders seat to take over. That's another, like, say, 65,000. So that's 130,000 people yeah. right there. If you just take probably, like, the south side of San Jose, you have more than 130,000 people, especially now San Jose is the large city north of L.A., yeah. you know, with mm-hmm. over a million strong. Yeah. And it's 177 square miles if you compare it to San Francisco, which is only seven square miles. You know, that's the one reason why the 49ers were smart in their marketing sense. Why they, you know, plus also they, they got deceived by Gavin Newsom. But right. But um, that's why they came down here. They realized a lot of the fan base come down here. You know, a lot of the fan and a lot of the business marketing. Because this is sort of, San Jose is sort of the epicenter, of basically, of Northern California. Yeah. You know, with the, with the dot-coms and now with the expansion of, of the, all the companies coming here. Mm-hmm. So you know the market's here. You know the people are coming here for the employment, even though it's the most, one of the most expensive places to live. But the income's here. We're also the richest city in the country, you know, as now recently named. And it's, it's just a, a dynamic. Now you got that being showcased on national TV coming up with the Super Bowl coming on February 7th on CBS, you know. So you got to figure that if you could have just 130,000 individual people to those seats, and then you only got, what, like a 17,000 seat arena for arena football, you know, and the, at the SAP Center, you can manage to, to have seats, individual different people for all three venues. 
at, at the same time. But the thing is, is that the way the market is is saying, well, you got the Raiders, you got the Niners, and you know, the Raiders are up in par whether they're going to stay here or move down to San Diego or whatever. You know, you know, so that, that's a whole other issue, and that's an NFL issue. But we're talking about the cost and affordability of that. If people are worried about, you know, the cost of living here is so much, and, you know, and that reflects on the way the Raiders and Niners do their pricing for their tickets and all that stuff because of cost. And the Niners with Levi's went to an outside party company in Dallas that did the season ticket hold there for the licenses coming to the San Jose area to do license here, which and they don't even know what's going on here because they don't live here and they won't struggle here. Right. Arena football is a price. Tom and I sit front row. And our tickets were not even four hundred dollars for nine games. We got the tenth game for free, which is usually the free, the first free, uh, first round playoff game, which we we did have against Portland this past season. So, because that's a, that's essential that with the SaberCats deal as far as for trying to get people to buy. So tickets. there's so there's no doubt that it, it, I mean, it, it you can't get, be you get a lot for your money, and then yeah. they got you know like for the for the families that have. They can get four tickets and like four hot dogs and like four, for like a, a, a really good price, right? But it creates an affordable atmosphere, yes, exactly. Because there's a lot of people that can't afford to even buy a regular ticket yeah. to go to a game, yeah. let alone. And I believe uh, forty dollars for parking. There's, 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 there's been a study now that you know, in order to take your family out to an NFL football game or an NBA basketball game or or even NHL, I don't know so much NHL That's but cool. MLB, it's going to cost you for a family of four. More than four hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. That's oh, a season ticket right yeah, there for yeah, the Sabercats yeah. or any of. Well, except for the LA Kiss, there you know, and some of these newer teams. We 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 could talk. We've talked about in the past that some of the news teams like Tom and I have gone down to LA. I've gone down to LA both their existence in Anaheim. Honda Center, great place. They just revamped. They got a what's brand up, new what's sound system. What's up with that field that they play on? Oh, you did with the weird color? Yeah. Yeah, they're trying colors. they're trying to be like this Boise State place, yeah, you know. Well, yeah, that's the thing oh. though. What color is it? It's gray. like it's like it's like, beige. It's like a tan it's or like something. It's like a gray. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's completely different. It's like cement gray. So, what like you Boise think? State. You know who else does that? Uh, Eastern Washington. Eastern Washington yeah. is red. Yeah. It's red. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. But you know what's kind of interesting is you had never seen it before LA Kiss got involved but because the LA Kiss is kind of like celebrity status. It's almost like they could kind of do whatever they wanted because you know the league is really trying to like hype it up and stuff, so that's why well, you that's have, like, also rock star well, type yeah. mentality. Well, I think also yeah, part of it to... is that when Doc McGee, Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, and Brett Bucci came in, Brett Bucci was the only one that was known about the Arena Football League from the state with the Rattlers for a couple years, and then with Orlando Predators, and then he transitioned to LA. But the other teams didn't know; they were all about marketing hype and the 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 Kiss Rock group members. Where like basically all they know is rock music and the music industry, you know. As me being formerly part of the music industry, not as big as that, but you know, I have had my dealings with music industry associates and deals. That that's how they do it. That's why Brett Bucci was one of the main key things to that. And then they bring in this guy Skyler from the Dodgers to come in and handle a lot of the a lot of the management stuff and and promotions of it. And he came from the baseball and. It's, it's completely so they did all this hype trying to bring in the Kiss Army fan club from the rock group to come in there that's why you see all the people in the Kiss face gear and, and then rock concert yeah, they yeah. don't sell a lot of tickets though they, at first year they had around 8,000 season tickets last year they had well, roughly around their budget, though. their budget though for, for each well, yeah. game they started they had these these ladies in cages that was the outside bar and then they try to turn it into you know they try to hype it up right they try to hype it up, make you, know, the, you would think the, the kiss is like the that's why masters that's of entertainment like, that's, that's, that's why that's, that's two what strip clubs yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, why yeah, i don't yeah, this, yeah. but this is an example of why i don't think you know going back to real quickly to your nfl element everybody was you know for the last month everybody's been talking about are the rams going to go to la are the chargers going to go to la are the raiders going to go to la L.A. residents don't care about football. And I think that, you know, the, the Rams are going to move there, and it's going to be a gorgeous facility. It's going to be the nicest stadium built in our lifetime. I mean, it's going to have a retractable glass roof. It's going to be... Better than Dallas? It's going it's oh, yeah, to make, make Dallas look... It's going to make Dallas look like the SAP Center. No, <laughs> which is, no, 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 no. It's going to make, it's gonna make Dallas yeah. look like the Coliseum. Really? It's going yeah, to have, it's a, ret- nice. it's gonna it's have a retractable yeah. glass Dallas roof. Dallas has retractable, yeah. but, but it's not glass. Not glass. It's, yeah. Not yeah. Gonna have NFL it's only partial rectangle. There, and then it's going to have the water around it. Yeah, it's nice an NFL, yeah. NFL Network studio inside of it. Oh, that's yeah. It's going to have iPads yeah. at all the seats. It's going to be beautiful. But let me tell you something. 
people in LA are going to be all blitzy about it for a year. Man, we got to go see that new stadium. Maybe two years. Yeah, Maybe two nice. years. Yeah, just to get but in wait, and after but, that. But as soon as as soon as Jeff Fisher starts taking his naps after week seven, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's just like the same thing with Niners in the Levi Stadium. They're going to stop showing up to games. Well, plus it's like you know football has not worked. In LA, and here's the thing: Twice. it's, it's going to take, you know, it's it's like, take almost two years to build that stadium. Yeah. Until then, the Rams are going. Until then, the Rams are going to be playing at the LA Coliseum. Yeah, this year. If they don't put together two winning seasons in those two years. Who the hell? Yeah. Who cares? Nobody's going to care. So I, that's why I don't. You know, when you, you guys are explaining all this, I, I'm not. I don't have any working knowledge of all this hype around the LA Kiss, but I have been to one game and I noticed that, you know, there was really nobody there. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, saying, so, so, like, taking advantage of, of David being here, you know, being part of the media and having that type of aspect. Now, of course, you had a good story this year, right, to yeah. be able to talk about the winning, you know, Bay Area team and this and that, right? Yeah. So, how, what would it take, from your perspective, to sustain the media uh, popularity the and to grow, yeah. and to well, grow I mean, this from now? Now, it certainly doesn't help having a league that's down to, what, eight teams that... Really could be seven teams because you know, so it's like will, to, that you know, doesn't help. To touch base on that, you know, I know the league is taking control of the Thunder, and my immediate my immediate reaction was, you know, they only have eight teams. How does a league control team automatically make the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole element of <clears throat> you can That's rest crazy. your if, I, for instance, if I'm the coach of the Rattlers right now, or if I'm the coach of the Sharks. Uh, I'm not letting my quarterback on the field until the playoffs. I don't have any. I don't have any reason. I don't have any reason to win. I'm out of just rest my players all year. Yeah. And then yeah. during week one, I'll just throw. I'll throw Stanley out there. I'll throw uh, Tommy Grady out there. I'll just. I'll just keep him on the bench all year. I don't want him to get hurt. Yeah. True. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's no incentive. To, right? to touch to touch base on what you're talking about. I mean, of course, the first thing you need to do is actually have a team here. To harness the the media attention, but you know, it, it really all comes down to you know you, you got to have you got to have a plan. You got to have endorsements. I heard I heard rumblings that the AFL was going to have some type of partnership announced with Under Armour. Yeah, yeah, that's supposed to be the jerseys and clothing. Is that actually happening? Because I they haven't finalized yet. The, what they just recently finalized was New Era for the Caps. Right, New Era for the Caps. Yeah. That's yeah. good. But if they get Under Armour. That's a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Under Armour yeah. has Curry. Well, it's officially, officially, yeah. there's going to be a new uh, jersey provider because the deal with Russell Athletic for both the hats, well, of course, for the hats and, and the jerseys, it's, it's gone. Under Armour is a big deal. Under Armour has Curry. Under Armour has Jordan Spieth, Tom Brady, yeah. you know, Cam Newton. Cam yeah. Newton, yeah. You know, yeah. they had a commercial on TV with uh, Misty Copeland, the first African American principal of the American Ballet Theater. She's on their ads now. Yeah. Under Armour's yeah. taken off. Yeah. Yeah. Under, I think Curry alone, I, I wrote a column about it last year, Under Armour reported 160% growth Jeez. in Q3. And that was just from the Curry Just one. Curry. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're not talking about Brady or Newton yeah. or Spieth. I mean, Jordan Spieth is like, he's on pace to do Tiger Woods-esque things, you know? Right. So Under Armour's taken off. I mean, we, we, we've lived in a very... Nike dominated world for a long time. The feel is gone. Adidas is gone. You know, uh, Adidas is still there, but they're more concentrated on soccer. They got, soccer. Dwight, they got Dwight Howard and they got Derrick Rose. <laughs> Derrick Rose and blew out his knee forty seven times. Yeah. And Dwight Howard, he's. I think they have. James, I, think, I, think, I think they yeah. have. I think they have James Harden too. But anyway, Under Armour is a big deal. If 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 the AFL can announce a partnership with Under Armour. Now that's credibility. Yeah, and just uh, billboard. They're, they're gonna need. They're gonna need at least two or three seasons of consistent growth and credibility. A stability first, and then slowly grow. And you know, you've got to have more cities, especially the larger cities. Domestically, have teams. domestically, you cannot so have. You you cannot have eight. eight teams. Well, yeah, uh, there's not enough. You're well, you got to remember back when they're out of your division. Now your conference two or three times. You got to remember. remember it totally disrupts. I know. I've, I know. I've heard. I know. I've heard. At least I've read. That Butera is very fixated on the idea of aligning AFL teams with people that own their yeah the their primary buildings. tenants yeah. yeah and that's great NHL NBA that's that's great that you should know? be on top of what's already there right well the thing is, is you know <coughs> like the Storm and the Gladiators yeah mm-hmm. they own the Storm also own an NHL team yeah the owners of the Gladiators uh, done yeah own the team that 
they well, own the, James plays right? yeah, and yeah. the AHL Lake Erie right. Monsters. Yeah. So that's important because. But those, then you also got the Jacksonville Sharks, who I think are also primary tenants of their arena. Are they? I think so. Yeah, who owns them? Um, Bucci, Jeff okay. Bucci okay. owns them. Well, see the thing there is, you know, you you know this being a single entity league. Now the teams, if you know, if I'm Jerry Jones or if I'm Brian, if I'm if I'm Larry Bear, the owner of the Giants. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, if I'm Joe Lacob, the owner of the Warriors, yeah. or Vivek, um, I'm a businessman, so my first goal is to make money. Well, then I'm going to position my team to be competitive, to sell right. tickets, yeah. you know, to attract viewership. I want to be on TV. I want billboards. I want magazine. I want TV. I want radio. you gotta, you got to align yourself with actual sports owners. You know, and, and all credit to the Fries for, you know, the, the uh, you know, the magnets that they've been. Yeah, in this community for the sport for the greater part of 20 years, but they're not sports owners. No, they're not. You know, they're not Hasso. They're not mm-hmm. Jed. They're not Larry. They're not you know Davis. Davis you know, they're not uh, Lou. Yeah. Or John Fisher. Or John Fisher. He was the main main owner of the A's. Right. Right. Silent uh-huh. partner. Yeah. yeah. So you know, and they you know they, they're renting space. Yeah. So from SBS. I think Dallas is perfect. Because Dallas, uh, you mean San Antonio? You mean San Antonio? Desperados? Yeah. Desperados? Yeah. Desperados Jerry was, Jones still owns that name, right? Yeah, but yeah, but they, yeah. Were, they were under Jerry Jones. Yeah, yeah, and and they and they they're. Um, I wish I would have gotten the. It was great. Game. Yeah. As far as you know, good being able to good, relations, good ownership, yeah, yeah. you know, they they promoted very well. They yeah. had good you know good fanfare. So, I, and, and he had a direct connection. He also actually pulled people from there uh-huh. on his team and invited them you know to training camp. So. Yeah. I, I heard that I heard that Same the, with Tom Benson. The Voodoo played at the Superdome. I would have been really curious to see what that. Yeah, the like. Sabercats oh, played there once, yeah. and it wasn't a, a good deal. Why they remodeled that, New Orleans Arena? That, well, that that is a huge. Oh yeah. I went to the Super Bowl there. Yeah. And the place is humongous. It is. It <laughs> is. I went to yeah. Arena Bowl in 2008, and that was right across the walkway from the New Orleans Arena. Oh, where the Pelicans play? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the Voodoo play. Yeah, the arena was small in comparison. New Orleans Arena. That's where they play. Okay. You know, well, they, I heard they, they played one season in the Superdome. Yeah, they did that while they remodeled New Orleans Arena is, because yeah, Tom Benson yeah, yeah. finally bought the, crazy, huh? the, um, the, the, the I, well, it's like Just Hornets. imagine how you could compare it to the NFL because you know how NFL is like this, right? Yeah. Just imagine putting an arena. Yeah. Well, that's what they did with the San Antonio Talents yeah. for the Alamo Dome. Mo- yeah. Well, yeah, most and the people, Alamo Dome was a piece of crap. Most yeah. people, most people don't realize. I, I, you know, people since I'm a sports, you know, I travel around and I go to all these stadiums and all these different arenas. A lot of people. Ask me for recommendations. Hey, I'm going to this city. Is this stadium worth checking out? Uh, if you ever have the chance to go to New Orleans, you absolutely have to go to the Superdome. Right. Yeah. You have to go to the Superdome and, and see why it's called the Superdome. Because yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should have its own zip code. It should, yeah. it, it's humongous. Yeah, you yeah. can fit you can fit a lot of stadiums inside. Well, well if you yeah. remember, that oh, yeah, was yeah. the epicenter of the Katrina. Yeah, yeah. Right. For, yeah. For, oh, yeah, yeah, for a reason. Everybody in New Orleans could fit in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why when I went to the um, to the Reno Bowl in 2008, it was one of the memorable because it was like one of the first championship games period in New Orleans back after the, the Katrina hit. Yeah, well, I went in 2007. It was the same situation. New yeah. Orleans, the city, uh, Superdome. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I'm just just from the outside. I went, the, you know, I was out there. In they July. changed the outside now. They had actually lighting now. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, humongous. The, but then when you go in, you, know, you got to go down the, you know, the, oh, yeah. the floor is yeah. down at the bottom. Yeah. So when you go, so in, they dug it in there. It's it's yeah. humongous. I'm, how many does it seat? Um, 60, 68,000, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not 000. so much the seating, it's just the structure. and The, the structure itself is, is big. It's, it's, it's a big concourse. Well, this is, you know what also says a lot is they could there's a, a lot of stadiums that aren't NFL capable today mm-hmm. because of all of the restrictions and all these rules and everything. That's one of the last venues that today it's still able to host a Super Bowl. Whereas all these other well, that's ones why they've had, had like three there in my yeah. lifetime. Yeah, I mean, they, I'm like, what do I got to? What do we got to do to be New Orleans? They've, yeah. they've, uh, I think in my lifetime they've had three Super Bowls there. Yeah, yeah. We're never gonna get one in in the Bay Area again. No, not in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, this day, yeah. Yeah. No, not Levi's. No. Yeah. So, um, basically, what, in your opinion, now, what do you think needs to do? Uh, what we need to do to maintain just getting media outlets? So, I mean, when you like. Go well, to so your, yeah. When you go to your meetings with, with other media outlets here, whether it be the Chronicle, the Mercury News, the Tribune or whatever from Oakland, or even the TV stations, what do you think they need to do to open their mind up just to even think about covering arena football? Not just because waiting until, like, 
on the day of Arena Bowl when I got called from KCBS to do an interview like that over the phone, and they did me like a little five second little blip on their radio right when I'm driving up to Stockton, you know, to go to the Arena Bowl. You know, what do you think that needs to do to widen open? What can we do to widen open the arena? Not just or the media, not just here in, in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, but in well, other arena markets. It, it, it comes down to the teams. You know, the teams need to need to maintain relationships with the outlets. They need to send tickets. They need to, you know, a lot of times it's it's it's, it's just it's like politics. You know. Yeah. Um, so sponsors get involved. Well, media I think I think involved, from, right? I think more from a from a more from a more you know broader. Eric's asking about what the league can do. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you certainly need to have more than eight teams. Yeah, definitely. You need, you need to have more than eight teams. You need to have at least 16 or 20 teams, you know. Yes. And that happens, you know, by, you know, as we said, keeping the markets, you know, in, in, in arenas where, you know, the, the primary tenant owns the team. Solid ownership. Well, well these, these sports owners, they're businessmen. So, you know, yeah. they're not going to own a depleting business or a depreciated business, you know, they're going to they're gonna market it. You know, you said it's a single entity league. They're going to market their own team to the community it's in. They're going to have outreach events. And with, this, have with this league staying that way as a single entity league, that's actually hurting the league, I believe. I think if we went back to like the way it was before the break, like what you were involved in, where the Sabercats well, paid you know, the players, were responsible to do the their thing, budget. I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing that's killing arena football is the two-way players. If you went back to Ironman players, and I understand you can't because of the CBA and everything, I think if I think if the Arena Football League had one, had two-way players, I'm sorry, yeah, two-way players, yeah, two-way players, mm-hmm. that would draw people. Come watch this guy play quarterback. Back Ironman football. Pl- come watch this guy play quarterback, throw a touchdown pass, and then line up, well, that's, line up as an from, outside from linebacker. From my conversations, right, right. I can tell you this. From my conversations sure the players with, don't uh, like it. with Steve Watson, who was the, we loved it. That's the executive yeah. vice president for the Players Union, he's not there. That's Ivan Soto now Ivan with James, now, yeah. James Barron now, the president. We'll get James Barron on the, on the show eventually. I'll reach out to him. But um, they're, they're actually open to talk about that. Uh, from a financial standpoint and a support standpoint, they want... To bring back the, um, the the Iron Man play, they want to bring it back to where it was by 2008, and not from uh, for a financial standpoint to where each team will go in and would say, okay, we're the Sabercats. We have X amount of dollars that we were putting as a Fry family, we're putting aside for this franchise, and we're going to play for like you know like James Hunden's salary and all that. Okay, I so I- let the team be responsible. If they can't afford, if the ownership cannot afford to pay their players. Their ticket salespeople, their advertising, the marketing, the rights to broadcast TV, rights to broadcast radio, that's on that franchise ownership then. They shouldn't be in the league. So that's why that's why you want the stability and having strong ownerships. So I think that's what the league needs to get back to. Let the players, instead of being all being merged where all the league's ownerships pay the, the money into the league, which gets distributed through every single player, and that's why they only pay basically $900 a game with the quarterback making around $1,000 a game. You know, with the fifty dollar win bonus. Is that what thing. they went back to? Yeah, yeah, they're they're down under like nine hundred dollars a game. Oh, yeah, I think the, I yeah. think the biggest thing, and you know, this is going to sound cold, but if the AFL wants to be recognized as a professional sports league, then they need to function like one. Yeah, you know, yeah. they and in order to function as a sports league, your players shouldn't have to go drive a bus after or work two or three jobs. Yeah, probation department. Well, yeah, our probation department. You, you know, you you have. To, you want to be, it's kind of like, it's a cliche, but, you know. It's almost like a year-round occupation. Well, really. like, well, if you remember I, right I when the. Um, I, you know, in the NFL, players, there might be five or six guys in an NFL locker room that are making seven-figure salaries. The rest of them are making six. Yeah. And some of the guys in the NFL, especially the guys in the practice squad, have off-season jobs. They run camps. Yeah. You know, they do stuff with high schools or, you know, whatever. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a cliche, but if you want to be recognized as a professional sports league, then you need to function as well. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't help that in the last four years, there have been double-digit losses in yes. terms of available teams. Yes. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's going to, at least on my side of the world, you know, or my side of the, the fence or the tracks, whatever you want to call it, no one's going to write about the AFL when... 
every not, every six not credible, every yeah. every six months. No stability. You know, and if if we remember correctly, last year the voodoo and the and the outlaws yes. were under league control, and then weeks later they were they were done. Yeah, the voodoo. Now the thunder are under league control. The only way I think you you have a credible season is if the Thunder play every game on the road. Yeah, yeah and with right. the with the situation with the Voodoo, the Voodoo is one of the last AF2 members that were strictly under ownership from the AF2. Well, I'm sure you heard about this too. With Dan the, Newman, the lawsuit that was filed against Neil Simmons. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. At the Outlaws. Yeah. Yeah. His investors are suing him. Yeah. For fraud, they're alleging legitimate fraud, yeah. <laughs> saying that Vince Neil why. Right. Yeah, he took their yeah. money and right. didn't pay his. I read that in the courthouse news in Las yeah. Vegas. Yeah. Didn't, yeah, didn't pay his uh, posting fee yeah. or his franchise fee. Like three million dollars. Yeah, yeah. And they're like they're, um, a couple, like two and a half million. There needs to short. be there needs to be due diligence and there needs to be credibility. And you know, we talked about how Commissioner Butera is a very reasonable man, in my opinion. But the way he got his job. Just a question. There's no credibility. Yeah. You know, like an owner can just, you know, add somebody to that. Placate, yeah. the, you know, just place someone in a position of power and backdoor. Can you imagine if, if Jerry Jones tried to position, tried to run Roger Goodell out of town and put someone, like, you think that would happen? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah Patroy Aikman. Not even, not, even in the, yeah. not even in the NFL, in the WNBA. Yeah. Because that's yeah. really, if especially I had, if you're having somebody that if, is no longer in sports and yeah. went from casinos to sports. If yeah. I had to, if I had to, well, that's another thing. And the AFL has their front office in Vegas. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No yeah. other, no other sports league. And well, they have two front offices: one in Vegas, still one in Chicago. I don't care what Rob Manfred or the media wants to tell you about the NBA being okay with legalizing sports gambling. Maybe Rob Rent, Rob Manfred's okay with it, but none of the 31 owners in the NBA are ever going to be okay with it. There's never going to be a sports team in Las Vegas, no matter how hard they try to get oh, a yeah, hockey yeah, team yeah. there. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. I've, talked to lots, for that. I've talked to lots of owners in the NFL, lots of owners in the NHL, and lots of people, you know, and the like. The, the closest comparison I can draw to the AFL in terms of functionality would be the WNBA. They have similar crowd sizes. They play during the off season. You know, it's a it, it, you know, it, it's it's kind of a hit or miss on the TV schedule. And the WNBA functions fine. Yeah. You know? So maybe maybe they need to do something where they where they partner up with you know with the NFL. The NFL, I was about to say that. It would be great in the perfect world if every NFL team had, had a an seat. AFL uh, yeah, team. Yeah. Owned an AFL team. Yeah. I guarantee you oh, yeah. everything that you're asking will come true. And the NFL, yeah. you know, it's like out here. People have been commanding the Jed York sell the 49ers, and I've asked them, I've asked them, if you had a money tree, would you chop it down? Right. <laughs> the NFL, it's, it's like the Department of Treasury up the street there at Levi's Stadium. You know, just there's money going in and coming out of there 24-7. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, but Yahoo paid upteenth million dollars for the sign the size of a window. <laughs> and so did United, yeah. and so did Citrix, and so did SAP. If you had the your dream car, what would it take for you to sell it? You'd never sell it. Never. Never. My mom offered That's a good investment. Give, my mom That's offered a good investment. Give, my mom offered to give me an NFL team. Well, am I gonna say no? Right. <laughs> even, even if it's the Jacksonville Jaguars, right. I'd still take it. And that's the situation with Jacksonville Jaguars, maybe becoming the St. Louis Jaguars. Well, anyway, so well, you still own it, and just, I think you just yeah, bring we, in somebody we know we know that the NFL the NFL is a, a nonprofit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So you know, if 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 the AFL can position themselves to be attractive to the NFL, we all know that the NFL doesn't really care for offseason football, but this country wants more football. Yeah. We love football. So all of a sudden you go from eight teams to 30 or 32. Every NFL team has an AFL team. You just tripled your size. Yeah, and, and, and the then, NFL then you team take, doesn't you have to have a staff NFL team in its That city. works on the, the NFL, NFL teams. It works. It, you, you, you take a satellite and I guarantee crew you, I and you bring them over. I guarantee you that, and I, and I hate to slander the, the product, but I guarantee you that the talent on some of these NFL practice squads... Eric Meyer would not be your starting quarterback. <laughs> Bethel Thompson will come back. 
<laughs> like, can you imagine Jared Hain on a 50-yard field? That'd be crazy. Yeah. The talent is there. You know, this country, this country, yeah. this country produces football players like the Dominican Republic produces cigars. They just spit them out. And how many times have you seen a player get a second chance? Maybe wasn't drafted, come back as an un unsigned free agent or, you know, undrafted free agent. With the 49ers. And then, then boom. You know, so it's like that's another avenue or an opportunity for them to find that's players. That's what happened with me once I got there you go. four years I got released with the Bengals. Yeah. Came play next to Phil after that one year when they folded, yeah. I got called by the Saber Cats. Well, the I Niner, wasn't done the, playing. Yeah. The Niners just signed this week, the Niners just signed not one but two players from the Canadian football league. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. another thing. The oh, they signed um, the guy from the, the Portland Thunder. Thunder. Portland Thunder. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Rogers. Eric yeah. Rogers. Yeah. That's another thing. The Canadian football league has functioned for a long time. I love Canada. I played up here too. Yeah. Why can't <laughs> the Calgary Deputy? Calgary and Toronto. Why yeah. can't why can't the AFL do something with the CFL? Well basically the the AFL does have relationships with both the NFL and the, and the AFL as far as for um, other league assignments for the players. So like you know, like say James is with the Sabercats. Okay, he plays his certain amount of games, but then somehow um, he gets called up. A recruiter called, from called the, an NFL team said, yeah. hey, we want to check this guy out and at least put him on our practice squad to check him out. Yes. So he, he, he gets put on other league exempt by the AFL, and then he goes up to the 49ers, and he'll play, do whatever he does up there. But now let's say that the team, for whatever reason, wants to cut him, and he's gone, he's done with the NFL. Then he can go his back. property, his rights, are still owned by the AFL team. Yeah. And that's what they explained when the, um, it happened with the LA Kiss, when... Donovan, uh, what, uh, what's it, Adrian McPherson. Oh, yeah. Adrian McPherson was playing, and then he got recruited by, I think it was at the Toronto Argonauts. Argonauts? I, think, yeah. I think it was either Toronto or Cal I think it was Toronto. And he got recruited there, but so, and I think what they said, who was it? I think it was um, Paul Stanley was on an interview saying that, yeah, but when, when he's down up there or whatever reasons, Adrian comes back, he's with our, he's our property still. But it's an open ended agreement for both. It's unfortunate there are a lot there were a lot of NFL teams that try to get players from particular uh, arena teams and yeah, it was you know, um, let's just say people spoke up for the players saying that they weren't interested. And I heard quite a few of those stories when I played, and um, I mean, that's not right either. Because it's an opportunity, you know, it, the level of selfishness, you know, because this person has an opportunity, and then you speak for him, so he's not interested. Yeah, and for the fans, from the fans' standpoint, that makes it look like, you know, arena football players are more appreciative of what, of what they're doing. They purely enjoy the sport game I think, of football and it yeah. shows with their relationship with the fans and not letting the money get to their heads. Yeah. Well, like, there isn't a lot of it to be to well, get to their heads. Back it, in the heyday when they were making money, like, you know, Green was making six figures, you know, in the, in the heyday and James was probably making around five or upper fives. I you know. No? No? Right. It, the, the most... The, that, the, the, the most your, your agent then? <laughs> no. No. They, how, how, how the team function? Yeah. They paid who they want to play. Pay. Basically, I was, I was like one of the lowest paid. Oh. My, my, my uh, 2002 year? Yeah. You know how much I made? About 28000 So, yeah, that's, that's five and then, figures. Yeah. And, then, and then by the time I got to... Um, I guess going to next one, I think I ended up making about forty five, fifty, if that. But see, they were trying to be slick. Well, you, well, this is what you make at your job. My job, no, don't factor in my job. This, I'm earning yeah. this. And so they didn't want to pay me no more. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I would say there was any downfall, I didn't. I didn't like that part of the business. Yeah. You know, um, I was a much better player. Then to find out that another player who played my position was making six figures. So was that like very hush hush as far as? Because now you probably figure the quarterback is making quarterback definitely makes six yeah, figures. Yeah. But I, to me personally, I think your 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 specialist, defensive specialist, offensive specialist, and the quarterback should be the highest paid players. Yeah. Yeah. that's where you get even everything. In, is even going. in today's yeah. league, yeah. the quarterback makes more money than the regular players because everything you know, like the AFL, focuses around being offensive oriented yeah. and try to get those points on the and board. They have the ball, so they have to give more incentive for to get the right quarterback to come and play. Yeah. You know, so but everybody that play quarterback cannot play in the arena league. Right? Yeah, oh yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole. That's why we piece. said when we take the picture of Kurt Warner going from the Barnstormers to the Rams. You know, he was like, "Oh, I'm in the, I'm in heaven going from the Barnstormers to the Rams because he's he's got so much room and breathe and say like yeah. be constricted in a. In well, a he didn't want chainsaw, to play. You know? He didn't want to play in the arena league at first. He was because at that point he was so disappointed that. I don't know. 
you know, he didn't make it in the NFL at that time. So it took some convincing for Kurt Warner to uh, get over there. Yeah. So, um, so, so what? Uh, so, how long? How, what are we doing on we, time we here? We got around a minute fifteen or an hour fifteen into it. Okay. What do you guys? You but guys we want to close up something. Or wanna... We'll just close up something. So, what, from your perspective, from the media standpoint, and then separately from a fan standpoint of the AFL, what do you think Batera should be doing? And just to let you know, if the listeners of the show, Batera will be coming on the Nation podcast in around a month. We will have a short discussion with him, but. What do you think that you know Bateri should be focusing on to try to stabilize the league and try to get the fans more involved and trying to have more faith in the league on what he's trying to do? Well, I mean, I, from what I've been able to see, the the arena football fans just as a whole are, are just as passionate about their sport as any other fan that I've ever encountered with any other sport, you know? Um... I, you know, I can't. I can't really speak for the commissioner. It seems like he he gives access. Like you know, as I was telling you before we sat down here, I've never been able to get a commissioner on the telephone. Yeah. You know, or have a private conversation. I, you know, we had Gary Bettman in town here, the commissioner of the National Hockey League, uh, this past week, and you know, I couldn't even get a question in. Yeah. I've certainly never been able to get a hold of anybody in Roger Goodell's office. So, you know, Butera yeah. makes Butera makes himself readily available. And I think that's great. You know, he's he's available to answer questions and he doesn't shy away from it. Yeah. That's that's good, you know. But you know, there there just needs to be more credibility. Yeah. You know, the the, the allegations of of cheating in the league, the commissioner told me that if, if there were ever any case where the league suspected the Sabercats of cheating whatsoever, that that would have gone through his office. He, he called it categorically false. And, of course, I've, I've had response from the folks at Arena Fan and other places tell me that the Sabercats got caught cheating uh, and, and Dave Fry didn't want to pay the fine, so that's why he folded the team. And, you know, as I said before, you know, the... The Fries may not be sports owners, but they're very shrewd businessmen. Yeah. And they've built a business empire from virtually, you know, they had a, they had a jump start, but, you know, they what they have, they've built on their own. You know, they're not like D- this Donald Trump is living off his daddy's legacy. Yeah. That's not the Fries. Well, they're, also, they reinvented the team twice. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they very, they're, they're very smart businessmen. And I think we're starting to see now... What they might have foreseen, you know, I, I wrote my column that, you know, I had a source tell me that there was a proposed, there was a proposed budget increase where they wanted to nearly double the league spending. Yeah. But there has been no reported revenue. The commissioner has only sold one endorsement deal to some company called Go RV for like twenty thousand dollars. You know, and they said they said that at least Kurz was bringing in what he was spending, and Butera is not doing that. And there's a question of, you know, I brought up in my original column. There's a question of, you know, richer teams paying for the existence of poorer teams, and people said that I was crazy when I broached that subject. And well, Terry Emmert three weeks ago said the same thing. Yeah. So you know. I would just um, recommend that the fans do their own research and ask the right questions. You know, it's 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 this isn't this isn't Fort Knox. This is the Arena Football League. Yeah. People are available to speak to you, and if you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answers. You know? And I think we'll we'll dig deep into that. You know, when we have uh, Butera on the Nation Podcast in the, in the coming weeks. So and and it's actually honorable that like you know. What David said about him having access, having Batera's cell phone number and had access, you know, to contact him if he has any questions or anything or just general conversations that he wants to talk well, about. I think Butera is well aware that the image of his product is tarnished. Yeah. You know, and especially, you know, just the fact that the league is taking control of, of the Thunder but not the defending champions. I mean, you're 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 not gonna, you know. Can you imagine if the Warriors? That's crazy. Can you imagine if if you won a championship, and then the next year you didn't get to raise a banner? 
Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like... That's the whole point of playing sports, is, right. is for the ring. Yeah. For the and, ring. you know, and I the can... the players are wondering can, whether they are going to get a ring or from, not. From a, when I was younger, from a personal perspective, you know, the, uh, the last... Well, not the last, the, the one before the last, in 2004... You know, a lot of people, whenever Gary Bettman, the commissioner of the NHL, goes anywhere, he's always booed, immediately booed. Whenever he presents the Stanley Cup, and as soon as they give him the microphone, you'll hear any arena that he stands in just boo him incessantly. Yeah. And I kind of feel like most people hate Gary Bettman now because it's the thing to do. They don't have any real reason to. Yeah. Well, he's me, knocked down the, uh, the, the guy in the top, right? Uh, yeah. Well, for me, the reason why I didn't like him when I was younger is because right before that 2005 lockout, the Tampa Bay Lightning had won the Stanley Cup, and since they were on strike, they were forced to pick up their Stanley Cup rings in a parking lot. There, there was no parade. There was no banner-raising ceremony. They literally pulled up to the parking lot of the arena and picked up their rings and drove off. There, there's no, there was no recognition. There was no pomp and circuit. Of course, there's a banner there now, but I kind of feel like you're kicking off a new season of arena football sans the the defending champions and I feel like that that hurts your credibility too well, yeah. 2002 2004 we weren't really recognized after winning the arena ball I do I do remember, actually to bring it back I don't know if it was 2002 arena ball or 2004 but I did come across somehow I don't know how I did it but I came across on a search there was a picture of some of the Sabre Cap players and coaches in the mayor's office getting Chamber recognized or the Chamber of Commerce, Chamber yeah. Of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce wow. by the mayor getting recognized on, in a closed wow. private party. This year, after the Arena Bowl, I personally emailed Licardo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would probably have more success with Reed because I went to high school with Reed's daughter, mm -hmm. you know, but Licardo apparently went to a high school with my, my sister's husband. So what, ha so what happened? They so basically they referred me saying that the cultural affairs department, which I don't know why would be even involved in yeah. a sports team, um, is talking with the management of the Sabercats. And I found out that was not true. They were discussing on it what the Sabercats wanted to do. Wow. You know, and I, I said, um, it shouldn't so, be so, really so, so really, our celebration for fans... Well, was whoever the post -game got invited party. to the post game party? Post game you were party there. At the you were there with the own at the restaurants or wherever we. No, you're talking about uh, the uh, yeah the gamer lounge. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about for for this year. Our fan celebration was for the fans who were uh, because it was up in Stockton and they had the the, the tour buses that brought the fans up there. Uh -huh. uh, those tour buses didn't stay, so the fans who went yeah. had, sort of had to leave. Yeah. Um, and then the the garage attached to the arena they had still to had its. Um, Hours to close because I was I was stuck. Yeah, I couldn't get out of the garage. I we had to wait for security or somebody. Me and, and Mark Johnson, who you know is. Um, we talking the, about the, the garage cat. that was next door. They closed the yeah, gate. Yeah, they closed yeah. the gate, That's and we had to wait like yeah. 15 minutes for the, the guy to come and roll it up. So and those 2002, where, where we were at a restaurant afterwards. Oh, really? Wow. With the cheerleaders yeah. and wherever fans came, but I mean, it's like we just won the freaking yeah. arena ball. Yeah. Right? yeah. Tell you what, though, I got I got to lift the, the trophy up. The thing's pretty damn heavy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I felt it too. Yeah, and actually, they had me wheel it out at the. Actually, arena we did two oh, things. Yeah. Actually, the, um, the Fry family did two things. Uh, immediately after the victory of the game, they had the, the they party had the, at the, the arena. record club up in the arena on the third floor. Yeah. They had that, and then uh, shortly after the the Stockton Ports Farm game was done at their stadium, they had the fireworks. Outside, they had the fireworks. Yeah, because I remember yeah. everything's going on. So we hear there's like. Bang, 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 and and then Reggie Gray took his phone out. And I saw a video he posted on Facebook that he was able to catch some of it. Yeah, and then so also it was all cool. Yeah, wow. and then a couple weeks later, they had the, the Dave Fry had the little meeting yeah, at the FK to make it a little more personable they, for everybody, especially for the fans they, who couldn't stay. They replayed the arena ball. Yeah, which is yeah, which, which is kind of a surreal atmosphere, right? You and the, the owner, you got the head coach, you got some players, and you're watching like a, what a month after the arena ball, you're watching it on screens with them. And you're able to like interact. Yeah. I think the best thing that happened in 2004, of course, I wasn't a part of because I flew on a private jet. Was that over to uh, uh, they went Vegas? To Vegas. Okay. He yeah. got on John the Palms. Oh, John were, you with, the uh, were, said, you, were you with? Were you with? What's his name? He's in prison now. 
Oh, uh, uh, Omar. Yeah, well, I was on the plane with Sequiti? him. Coming back. Yeah, he's in prison now. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah, you don't remember that? Well, I remember the story. The IRS, the IRS raided the Fry's headquarters. I remember that. So I didn't ever heard. He got he got like thirty years. Wow, he did. Omar Sequiti or whatever his name is. He was the coolest dude. I had no idea. He had all that sponsorships. That's why he was cool. All that money. But also, I think you know maybe you guys can look into this. I I haven't, but I I've heard some rumblings that. Possibly off the record. Well, I guess we're recording, so it's not <laughs> off the record. But Coach, you sure you Coach Arbet knew before the season started that it would be the last one. Wow, well, I don't know. And I heard that from some. I could sense something. I because the way I heard, he, I, I heard I've never seen him broke down in motion like that at the Green Bowl. Were, were you in the post game press conference? Yeah. Oh, you were. Okay. Well, I, I heard. That mm-hmm. he knew that it was going to be the last season, so. so. Yeah. yeah, I guess everybody yeah. knew but the players. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't <laughs> tell the players. Fans. You can't tell the players because you, you know. Can't like, tell the players, but I mean, how do you find out? Well, they were still yeah, they were they were still resigning after they after they after they won the arena bowl. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. all these players yeah. and all of a sudden. Yeah, back Highland and some yeah. players, some yeah. players, yeah. And now you got the the Saber Cats of the South California part. You know, the L.A. Southern California Cats. You know, I think I think the kiss will be the first and only time. I've cheered from a, for a team from Southern California <laughs> right. in my life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're going like an extension. Beat LA to the Saber Cats. Yeah, no, because I... In a Omar, small part. In a small part, yeah. Well, yeah. All, and, and, I respect Omar. You know, yeah. there, are, there are still times, you know, I'm supposed to remain impartial being a writer. Yeah. But there are times where, you know, I was born in Northern California. Yeah, and you're an I ultimate grew, sports fan. Yeah. I grew up cheering for the Giants and the Niners and the Sharks. And whenever the Kings came or the Dodgers came or... Yeah. You know, it was. I would rather cheer for the Soviet Red Army than, than a team <laughs> right. from L.A. You know? <laughs> right, yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna actually gonna get, we're gonna go over to the first game yeah. over there. Yeah, and I think I think uh, what, yeah. the lookout for the L.A. Right? Kiss. April 2nd? April April second is the first game for yeah. the Kiss against the Jacksonville Sharks. Um, yeah, the first was, game yeah, of the year is cool. is on April first, and yeah, to bring out that's gonna be on CBS Sports Network. I think that's Arizona Rattlers at Portland Thunder. So. You know, and a lot of people are saying, "Oh, April Fool's Day, start a league on national TV." What's that going to turn out? You know, the fan—it's going to be a joke on the fans who show up at Moda Center. You know, but um, mm. who knows how how it's going to turn out? But yeah, Tom and I are going down there. We're meeting up a guy, Noisy Norm. You probably know him. Yeah. Yeah, he lives down in L.A. now, <laughs> oh, in the area of L.A. with his wife and his kids. So we're meeting up with them. We're meeting up with the, 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 the L.A.'s ninth man ambassador, Brian Fox. Um, David. They, play, they play at the Honda Center, right? Yeah, Honda I'll Center. probably go down there. Yeah. And we'll meet up with you. Uh, and we then got, they're, they're after their post-game uh, uh, players dinner is over at the Tilt to Kilt. Yeah. Just right pretty on the much stadium and walking promenade. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Five minutes so away. Nice. They had tilt to, Coaches are there. They had Tilt to Kilt yeah. when I lived in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Let me try, let me try to make that. It's oh, yeah. before my birthday. Oh, there you go. Oh, come with us. We'll give you tickets. I'm at the, I'm at the, I'm at yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. get you Well, you know I got to ask the wife. You know, make sure. Congratulations, by the way. Congratulations. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, James Hunter's going to be a little bit more off off the calendar now, you know, because he's taken. <laughs> we no, can't we can't have him on the show all the time. You know, she she she's actually very encouraging, and you know, she she knows nothing about football, so I'm educating her. So now that she's, I, I did a podcast for um, a former player at Portland State. And I'm doing this one. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are inviting me to different places. So now she's just like, I really had no idea of like. You know, Your significance, yeah. Who you really yeah. were and what you did. So yeah. she's every yeah, and, day we talk. She's like, wow, and to be I, honest, I, we, we look to grow this podcast as as one entity of the Ninth Man Nation called the Nation Podcast. But we also, I also want single to do, entity podcast. Yeah, I want to do uh, <laughs> Nation TV too. So awesome. on the on a side note, Tom and I also have another project that we do. It's called Simply Make Cocktails, where we review spirit and, and, and cocktails, and and we do a craft style and all that stuff. We're getting ready to relaunch that show, and we're going to be doing it in 4K Ultra HD. I'm going to have a brand new camera for that show, and I'm going to not just use that camera for that one show because it's sense it costs a good penny. Uh, but we're going to also do it for for this show. We're going to launch Nation TV on NinthManNation.tv, which is our YouTube channel. Oh, that'd be great. So we, we, already, did a, we already did a live yeah, stream. Yeah. We already did a live stream. Uh, but unfortunately, the bandwidth here, uh, we're at Blue Water Seafood Crab, which is our sponsor. And we know the owner. I know the owner here personally. Tom knows him now too. And it's getting to know him more and more. And it's, it's a great place, you know. And this was um, two years ago, 2014 season. This was the official sponsor for the SaberCats for the post-game meet and greets that they had. Wow. Okay. So they had it here, 
and um, it's a great place. That's why you have the the Sabercats championship banner from 2007. Sorry, not yours. Mm-hmm. And then my ninth man nation, um, you know, or not nation, but San Jose's ninth man, the fan club I run. I have their rally towel that I created for some of the fans. I created like a hundred of those. So they have that hanging out. They're very supportive of the team here. So. Well, see, and all that was the most fun I ever had as a professional football player. One, two thousand two, or two thousand four. Just the arena football oh, league, okay. my, my experience in general. Yeah. But ultimately, the, the the best thing is to help this team win a franchise, uh, arena bowl. For the first time ever, like yeah. that's that's what stands out. Oh yeah. So all the other arena bowls are great, but yeah. you can't take that that 2002 year away. Well, the thing yeah. is, you come in in '95, and I actually was uh, I, I was there from the beginning in '95, and you know you had Tony Kimbrough and you had some, you know uh, Titus Dixon, Titus Dixon, and, yeah. and you had these players and everything, and they came close, but they just they just never got. Get, yeah. So just yeah. Couldn't get past. And yeah, 2002 was so special because it was at home. In front of the fans, with the Arizona Rattlers, and our nemesis, uh, yeah, yeah, our yeah. And, and, and to, to beat them in the fashion that that you guys did, it was something special. It was like, I mean, you can watch that highlights. That's fun highlights because you can watch the whole game and only see a one sided show. Right. So I know they say, oh, it's kind of boring and this and that and everything. Uh, it wasn't boring, but was, the thing is, it's like no, no, for a fan, don't, don't it's like it's awesome. And here's the interesting thing about football, football team. When you get the right people in the right positions that know how to execute plays on the offensive and defensive side of the ball, yeah. I mean, that is the best experience that you can ever have. And, of course, you've been there since 95, so San Jose Sabercats have had plenty of talent yeah. throughout yeah. the years. But put it, it all together. Put missing all together. that one into yes, get it. You can have a bunch of great athletes on the team, but uh-huh. if you don't have the right attitude, if you don't have the right mentality, you don't have the right work ethic. So it's about being very strategic with who you get, the type of people that you have on your team. That's going. That all has that one common goal. In 2002, I mean, well, actually 2001, we were we were pretty got much close. There. Yeah, yeah, we got close. Got close. You know, and yeah. from that year when we seen that. Man, one game away. Uh-huh. I mean, 2002. That eight, that eight inside you guys the whole. Oh yeah, off season. So we came into it. We had no idea we were gonna start off at yeah. you know, 12 and 0. Yeah. But yeah. just the way we just handled business and, and approached the game and had yeah. fun and were very dominant. We had the right people in the right positions. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't toot my own horn, but I do, I do feel Dude, that man, you deserve it because yeah. of if you're a great member of the team. The position that I played and how I was able to make a difference in that position oh, yeah. is what helped contribute the success for you know the roles and and, and everybody else that played on the outside yeah. to get open. Yeah, I mean, I caught a lot of touchdowns, but. When I understood the play and what Terry Malley was trying to do, uh-huh. I would purposely go and occupy other people when they would get back there just so Reed can drop the ball off. So I knew what I needed to do to help. Yeah. A lot of people don't think. Selfless. Selfless. Very, very yeah. selfless because I knew I was going to get mine. Yeah. But if I don't do what I need to do to help stretch that defense, Reed only has so much time to throw. So you may not get open in that particular situation, but because you set that play up, it's going to dictate what the defense does after that. And it like, and Grieve readjusting. automatically, though, if I got off the line clean like I usually did, mm-hmm. Grieve automatically knew by the time I was five yards down the field of where he's going to go with the ball. So if that corner was flat-footed yeah. and I'm hauling yeah. down the middle of the field, yeah. I mean, how many times you see me catch bombs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, just yeah. one, one play drive from the five-yard line, yeah. boom. But then whenever you have that backside corner that want to come inside more, yeah. well, then I knew, okay, well, I want to occupy him. I'll just take it here, make him come here, and yeah. drop it down the road. The road does this thing. And it also it's also knowing where to throw the ball, right? Outside, inside. Because, I mean, you throw it to the wrong side, boom, interception, right? All about, yeah, all about knowing the coverage is. And, it, and, 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 you know, and that linebacker not being able to go outside the box, you know, it still made the window tight across yeah. the middle. So, like I said, that offensive specialist position, I really saw how valuable that position was. Mm-hmm. Everything basically operated off what I did in the middle. What I did in the middle, if I didn't have a great game, we wouldn't go have a great game mm-hmm. because I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow myself to get somebody open. So my mindset was no one could cover me. Yeah. 
That's good. I never, I never said it to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll say it now, but the mentality yeah. I had was no one could cover me, and if somebody covered me, it was my fault. Yeah. Because I'm better than you. Oh yeah. And I had the Michael, jo- I had the Michael Jordan syndrome. I do what I want to do to you when I want to do it, and that's, that's the mentality good. I had. And like I said, you know, you cover me, my bad. You talk mess, I got you. Next thing yeah. you know, hey. Yeah. Well, I hate yeah. to interrupt this little talk, it, it, it but doesn't we help. have that we have yeah. to start to cut this off because we're like an hour and a half. We could go on. We, we Tom went for say, hours. Yeah, yeah, Tom and I always say that if we could go on for hours, and I'm sure David can talk to us. He's a good sports guy too, you know, and that's the whole reason why he got in, into the journalist, you know, field of work that he's in to cover sports in a way to appreciate it more and to get yeah. more involved, and that's one way of segmenting to where I ran the fan club for this Harry to get more involved because I felt it was such a family oriented and I, I wanted. First of all, just the Sabercats to get more recognized than they are. And I want to continue going with, you know, David here with the Examiner and work with him. And even though the Sabercats are not available here locally, at least this year, watch out for next year. Who knows? You never know. You know, there's already been two offers on the team, but unfortunately in the league. So this is, a, you know, this is a good market uh, for Reading It's a good ball. market. It's, it's excellent a great market. market. I mean, it's been Fans a long last team market. Wanting the, league to come, yeah. the team to come back. So with that said, I want to thank James for coming down here, you know. Thanks for inviting me. We've got, you, we got you off of your bus route, you know. Yeah. You know, me too. I work for VTA, which is another agency here, and I do a bus driving, but I have Saturday and Sundays off. And you make more money. Yeah, seniority. <laughs> I drive a, um, a free shuttle that I don't have to worry about, you know, payment. It goes through the airport. He's going to rub that in, isn't he? He is. I yeah. guess I'm going to have to get online when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you already did that. I thought they would give you that information like a year ago. Yeah, I, I did, but, you know. Yeah. We'll do it right here. I got my laptop. Yeah, you know, and I want to thank you guys because it's really hard to start this off from scratch, and, you know, Maybe this isn't the ideal setting, right? We don't have this fancy studio or whatever, right? Uh, but, you know, it's like the fact that we could have you, know, you guys here and contribute and everything. Hey, thank um, you guys for even It kind of inspires, it. it inspires us to, you know what, get more more cities involved and get more fans that are in other cities because I think it's, it's going to take more than just, I think it's going to take a, a, the fans to get involved to really try to grow this league Yeah, because the fans are very passionate about it. So I know. So by having you guys here, it inspires us and everything. And yeah. it, what we'll do is maybe we can kind of start connecting with other cities. We we'll have. We'll eventually we'll slowly yeah. by surely. Yeah. And of course, you know, the way we'll be doing that is through our uh, Skype and all that stuff. So we could have possibly a video segment on that because I can record the video and audio conversation. Like okay. if you listen back to um, the interview I had in episode three with Steve Watson, yeah. that was done via Skype. Right. He did it with his cell phone. So for, unfortunately. I guess my software doesn't record the video off a of cell phone, so I had only the audio portion of it. Okay. So, but we appreciate David coming down here. You know, Word coming to down AFL, and talking. Sports. Go back to the two-way player. Yes. 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 Did you get that, Matera? We might just yeah. have to have James here. Yeah. To, to Somebody who lived it. Somebody who lived it. You know. Right. So we thank you for listening. Uh, we're gonna have this up, and just for David, and just for anybody. Of course, if you're not locally here, you're not, you probably haven't seen David's articles both on the Sabercats and the, and the reason they're leaving you know, us, and plus the, the, the issue with the Portland Thunder. We'll put a link on the Nightman Nation Tumblr. We'll put it on the, the Nightman Nation Facebook, Twitter, and also we'll put it on the, um, the Google Plus page for Nightman Nation, his articles, and we'll, we'll also, also post it on the Nightman Nation website, nightmannation.net. Now, to keep up to date with Nightman Nation, of course, I said all those social media accounts, follow, like, whatever, do it, SoundCloud. Dot com Nightman Nation is where you hear this podcast. Follow us for the latest information, and we'll we'll be back. There. We want to thank David and James once again coming in. And now we're here at Blue Water, and we're going to enjoy what Blue Water has to serve, some delicious food. So we'll talk to you next time on the next episode of the Nation Podcast. Take it easy.